Hello and welcome to this session in which we would look at a CPA exam simulation. The first thing you do when you look at a CPA exam simulation is determine what type of simulation am I dealing with? Well, it looks like here I need to do some computation. So it's entry computation. I have to input some numbers here. Okay. Second is what is the topic of the simulation? Just by looking at this column here, it says adjusted adjustments to calculate federal taxable income. I might be looking at Schedule M1. Well, before I make that decision, let me just take a look and read what's given to me. Quest is a calendar year, accrual basis C corporation, nothing much about that. Uh, refer to exhibit above for a description of selected year two transaction. I'm not gonna look at the, I'm not gonna look at the exhibits yet. In column B, enter the amount to be reflected on Schedule M1. Reconciliation of income losses per books, with income per return as an adjustment to calculate federal income taxes. Good. Now I know the topic of this simulation. It's a Schedule M1. What should happen now? Stress level should go down. Confidence level should go up. Now there's only one exhibit here. It looks like here two transaction. They could give you multiple exhibit. It does not matter. It does not matter. Schedule M1 is Schedule M1. Whether you know how to reconcile Schedule M1 or not, that's a, that's a separate story because I'm going to show you, you are giving one exhibit, but I can take this exhibit and turn it into multiple exhibits. So the point is, the topic is Schedule M1. I'm studying with Farhat. I know Schedule M1 inside out. I can go ahead and get started. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna look at the exhibit. And if I look at the exhibit, it's given me the information here. Below this is a description of year two transaction from Quest financial statements and tax record. Now, for each item, I can give you a separate exhibit. This is what I meant to say. You are giving one exhibit, you think it's easy, but there are a lot of information here. So let's go ahead and get started. You focus on one topic at a time. Your income per books is 632000 So simply put, we're going from income per books to taxable income. This is what Schedule M1 is, going from income per books to taxable income. And what's the purpose of this? The IRS wants to see if you are reporting too much net income per books and not a lot for taxable income. They want to see that discrepancy, that difference. And again, Schedule M1 is fully covered at Farhat Lectures. Starting with depreciation. Well, I need to know what am I giving about my depreciation? Here's what I'm giving. Quest recorded book depreciation of 200,000. Simple English. Well, for gap purposes, we deducted $200,000 on the financial statement and calculated a maker's depreciation deduction of a 224 and a section 169 of 16. So there's a difference between the two. What's the difference? For book purposes, I took 200,000 of deductions for tax purposes, I'm taking 224, which is makers as tax, and section 170, 179 deduction as tax. So I am taking in total 240,000 in tax deduction. What does that mean? It means on Schedule M1, I have to increase my deduction. So it's a negative. I have to increase my deduction of depreciation expense of how much? Of how much? Specifically, 40,000. So for as far as this adjustment it's a negative 40,000 but again what is the negative it means it means if I'm going from 632 this is my net income per books I am going to deduct from this an additional 40,000 it's going to reduce my taxable income why it's going to reduce my taxable income because I am claiming more depreciation for tax purposes now remember depreciation the difference between book and book and tax, sometimes you have you claim more, sometimes you claim less. You have to understand how the information is giving. The information here, 200,000 was deducted to come up to 632. Well, if you're going from book income to taxable income, take an additional 40,000 because for depreciation for tax purposes, they're giving you more deduction. 
Now, before we proceed, make sure also, I, I, just, I, I don't want to mislead you, just make sure you read the, you read this real quick to make sure there is no other thing about depreciation. If there is, we're going to read it, then we'll go back and make an adjustment. But make sure, you know, you're done with depreciation. Because the next topic is cash dividend. Okay, that's easy. Quest declared and paid the $40,000 cash dividend in June year two and declared a 30,000 cash dividend in December year two payable in January. What's the adjustment on Schedule M1? I'll give you a minute to think about it. The adjustment is zero. Dividend has nothing to do with Schedule M1. Dividend has to do with Schedule M2. If you're preparing M2, you have to be aware of how to reconcile this, but we're dealing with Schedule M1. And I do have a separate recording for Schedule M2 if need be. But for this, you don't want to waste your time on the exam day. Zero, move on. Third item, charitable contribution. Let's see what we are told here. Quest paid $30,000 of cash contribution in year two and 10,000 of charitable contribution approved by the board of directors to qualifying organization were accrued at the end of year two and paid on the extended tax return filing date. We have to be very, very careful here. It's like there's a small trick here that if you, if you don't pay enough attention to it, you'll be in trouble, okay? We paid $30,000 cash contribution. That's fine. That's deductible for tax, and that's deductible for GAP. Because for GAP, you can deduct anything you want to, cash contribution. But it's also deducted for tax because you paid it. And 10,000 of charitable contribution were also deducted, were accrued at year two for financial accounting purposes. You can accrue anything you want to for GAP. You can also deduct this 10,000. How about for tax purposes? Can you take this $10,000 as a deduction? Well, let's see. It was approved by the board of directors. That box is checked because if it's accrued for tax purposes, it has to be approved. It has to be approved and it has to be paid by after three and a half months after the year end. So by April 15th. Was it paid by April 15th? No. It was paid on the extended tax return filing date. What does that mean? It means for tax purposes, I'm sorry, you're not going to get this for year two. You're going to get this deduction for year three, assuming there's no other limitation. But the 10,000, it did not check the approved, uh, it checked one box, not the other box, which is payment by by the original due date, which is three and a half months after the, after the deduction. So simple English, what does that mean? It means for book purposes, you deducted uh, I believe 40,000, right? Um, yes, for book purposes, you deducted $40,000 of, so to come up to the 632, you you, were dedu you deducted $40,000. That's fine, you are allowed to do that for GAAP. If you're going from GAAP to taxable income, guess what, you have to add back, you, you're gonna lose, you have to add back $10,000 as an adjustment. So in other words, you're going to increase your taxable income by 10,000 because you're going from book income to taxable income at the $10,000. Why? Because the $10,000 is not deductible this year for tax purposes. Why not? Because it was paid with the extension. You have to pay it within the original due date, which is three and a half months. If we were talking about a calendar year, taxpayer, it's the, uh, April 15th. Ordinary gain on sale of office equipment. Let's take a look at that. We are told Quest calculated an ordinary gain of 8,000 for tax purposes. We have a gain of 10,000 on the sale of fully depreciated office equipment to a 60% shareholder. So we have a gain. Well, it doesn't matter. It's a gain. Whether it's 60%, 30%, a gain is a gain. There is no limitation on the gain. So for tax purposes, we have 8,000 of a gain. Quest recorded a gain of $2,000 on this sale for book purposes. So remember, because we have a different depreciation, for book purposes, the gain was 2,000. Why 2,000 for tax? Uh, why 2,000 for books? 8,000 for tax? Well, different depreciation method. Different depreciation method will give you different book value. Different book value will give you different gains and losses between book and tax. But you are told the difference. So to arrive to this in net income per books, we were we added $2,000 of a gain. Where if we're going from books to taxable income, the gain should be 8,000. So what do I need to do? I need to add to my to this income, an additional $6,000, which is, the gain is good, but it's gonna be taxed. I'm gonna have to add $6,000, okay, $6,000. 
gain losses on sale of investments. What are we given about this? Quest recorded the following gains and losses on sale of investment in public companies for book and tax purposes. So sort of the same for book and tax. They have a loss May 1st, a gain June, June 2nd for 7,000, a loss on September 4th of 8,000. So let's net them out. Okay, if we net them out, we have 4,000 of losses plus 8,000 of losses, 12,000 in losses, uh, 12,000 in losses, 7,000 in gains. Overall, we have $5,000 in gains. That's that's basically what we have. I'm sorry, $5,000 in losses. There are more gains and losses. $4,000 in losses. Well, for gap purposes, what do we do for gap purposes? We would report the $5,000 of losses. The $5,000 is deducted. Capital gains, $5,000, it's deducted to arrive to the $632,000. How about tax purposes? How about tax purposes? Can you deduct excess losses? Because we have 5,000 in excess capital gains losses. Can we deduct this? And the answer is no, we cannot deduct this because we can only deduct losses against capital losses against capital gains and we have excess. So if we have excess losses and that loss has reduced our tax, uh, reduced our uh, book income by 5,000 to come up to federal taxable income, I have to add back those 5,000 because I cannot take it as a deduction. So there's a $5,000 deduction taken to come up to the 632. Imagine there's a negative 5,000 to come up to 632. Well, I have to add 5,000 to go to my taxable income. Ordinary, ordinary gains and losses on sale of property. Well, Quest recorded the following ordinary gain and losses on the sales of property to a 25% shareholder for book and tax purposes. So we have uh, $6,000 six thousand dollar of gain two thousand dollar of gain that's eight thousand uh eight thousand dollar of losses on july 15th and four thousand dollar of losses on may 18th so those are ordinary gains ordinary gains so what do we need to do with this ordinary gains well for one thing ordinary gains there's no special rules they're not like capital gains and losses okay and we are told it's the same for book and tax. There's no difference. The only thing you are giving here is the losses are for a 25% shareholder. Again, it does not make a difference because 25% shareholder, the related party rules don't kick in. What does that mean overall? It doesn't mean anything. There's no difference here. Remember, we're dealing with ordinary gains and losses. And we are told they are computed the same way for tax and books. There's no difference between the two. And the only thing that my throw students off is the 25% shareholder. It does not matter. It's it's 25%. The losses are regular ordinary losses. There's nothing to worry about. Therefore, the answer is zero. Now, if you know what what should they have done? Also, they should have told you to compute taxable income, which is you'll take 632 minus 40,000 plus 10,000 plus six plus five, and you will come up with taxable income. So let's let's summarize. And after we looked at this simulation, what is the key to this simulation? Well, the key. To, the, well, actually, yeah, uh, the the answer would be wrong. The last one, if you had one of them wrong, which is that's that's unfair. So that's good. They gave it to you separately. So the key is you need to know schedule M one adjustments, and each adjustment was independent from the other one. Some of them are real easy as long as not they're, they're all easy as long as you understand schedule M one. You're saying, but. But Professor Farhad, this is an easy simulation. I don't have a lot of exhibits. Well, yes. How about if I gave you, for example, for this for this line here, just, just to give you an example, okay? I would give you one exhibit, the schedule of depreciation of the assets, and I, you know, somehow the two hundred thousand dollar is there. Another schedule for makers, where uh, I don't even I don't give you the schedule for makers. I'll give you the tables. I'll say compute makers based on the following. And you have to come up with 224 and 16. So yes, this simulation could be could involve exhibits and it may not involve exhibits as the, the information is given here directly. The point, it does not matter. If you know your rules for schedule M1, if you're using Farhat and know the rules inside out, bring it on, bring schedule M1 on. You should be happy when you see schedule M1, whether it's a multiple choice or a simulation. All what I'm gonna tell you now, is to stay motivated, invest in yourself, good luck, and stay safe.